Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm Leon Weavers. I am the host of Dress and Drinks. Welcome tonight to the Costume Society of America's uh, series uh, in conversations on dress. Please I'm super remember. excited and pleased to introduce and have on Dress and Drinks tonight um, Sarah Kuiva, the curator for Hawaii and Pacific Cultural Resources at the Bishop Museum. She's an historian, an art historian, and a genealogist from Waimalu, Oahu. Kuiva specializes in 19th century Hawaiian history. She's a PhD student at the Sainsbury Research Unit for the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, UK. Her dissertation looks at the creativity and kapa production in early Hawaiian kingdom from 1810 to 1850. She completed her BA in Art History and Visual Arts from Occidental College and her MA in History from the University of Hawaii at Manila. So please join us in welcoming Sarah to Dress and Drinks. Sarah, join us now and really excited about your presentation today and talking with you about things. Hey, Sarah, how are you? And our cocktail for the evening is the Blue Hawaiian and the non-alcoholic version is there as well. Thank you for putting that in the chat. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to meet all of you. It's so great to have you. I'm super excited to see what you have to share with us today. I have to admit, I signed on to do this presentation because of the drink aspect of it, because I thought it was just so fun. So I hope everybody is drinking to stay warm. <laughs> I'm not drinking because I'm still at work, but you can drink for me. <laughs> Indeed. So, um, Sarah, why don't we just dive right in, unless you have anything you want to say to the audience, and we can oh, right in and start looking at some really cool things that you have to share. Yes, I, I look forward to this discussion, and um, I think it'll be really fun um, to kind of show you all the different photos I have and images, because I think that really gets to convey what, what the show um, and the exhibition rotation that I, I was responsible for um, really kind of captures. So um, aloha everyone. My name is Sarah Kuaiva. I'm the curator for Hawaii and Pacific Cultural Resources at Bishop Museum. Um, and I want to share today about an exhibition rotation that um, our team was able to accomplish um, earlier this year, um, a case that we called Elsie Crassus's vernacular style. Um, so we're going to talk all about the Art Deco period, but before we do that, I want to first let you know about what Bishop Museum is, where, where we're located, um, and a little bit of our history. Um, so we are located in Honolulu on the island of Oahu um, in an area called Ka'ivi Ula, um, which is kind of the middle section between um, the, the um, Makai or the more ocean side part of Kalihi and the Malka section or the more mountainous section of Kalihi. So we're smack dab in the middle. Um, this area is known for its very drenching rain, which we're experiencing today, which is called Popo Kappa, and its wind, which is called Olong Yu. Um, and we have been in this location since our founding, which was in um, 1889. So we're 134 years old, um, and we're one of the lar uh, largest and oldest institutions in Hawaii and in the Pacific. Um, in terms of our collections, we're spaced out between three different divisions. Um, I'm located in the Cultural Resources Division, but um, the museum also includes a library and archives um, and also Natsai collections as well, which includes everything from entomology to ichthyology, um, malacology, the, the whole gambit. So it, it's a pretty substantial museum with a pretty substantial collection um, across all, camp, uh, all different collections across campus. Um, the collections are 25 million strong and constantly growing. Um, so um, in, for, with that number, we're definitely in the top 10 in the US, I think, um, and definitely one of the largest museums um, in the Pacific region. Um, and I think one of the most important details about Bishop Museum that I, I wanna share is that the scope of Bishop Museum is specifically Hawaii and the Pacific. Um, and it's really rare and very unique to be able to um, be an institution that scope is based in the region which it's located. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about what that looks like in relation to the department that um, I work in. Excellent. Um, so, amazing. And I can't wait. I mean, 25, like the, you have such a huge collection. It sounds amazing. It's huge. And what's the most ironic and hilarious part about all of that is that um, 
the department that I work in, um, which is called ethnology, um, is 80,000 pieces and we're the smallest collection on campus. Um, so the largest collection is 12 million and that's just all bugs. Um, but ethnology is specifically 3D um, cultural material um, that was intentionally collected. Um, and, and we say that intentionally collected apart um, to differentiate ourselves from archeology, span which is material usually found from an archeological context. Um, that being said, though, even though we are the smallest collection on Bishop Museum's campus, we are definitely the largest in terms of footprint. Um, we take up um, at least space in three different buildings on campus. So uh, there's definitely a lot to cover, um, and there's a lot of materials that then curators like myself can then utilize um, in different exhibitions and rotations, etc. Um, I want to point out a few different collections very briefly um, to, to kind of give you a sense of um, what it means to be 134 years old um, in Hawaii, in the place that we have always been located. Um, our founding collections here at Bishop Museum, which are located in the ethnology department, come from three um, royal descendants of Kamehameha the Great, who was the unifier of the Hawaiian kingdom. Um, and so they were all um, cousins of each other who actually died um, within um, a very short amount of time from each other. Um, and so as a family, their, their material was then gathered by um, Poahi and her um, husband, Charles Reed Bishop. Um, and, and then it was decided that a museum would then be opened to showcase this family's collection. So the founding collections of Bishop Museum comes from the Kamehameha families. Um, but we also should not point out that there are other things that eventually made their way to Bishop Museum. It also includes um, the Hawaii National Museum collection, which was um, the Kingdom's National Museum. And um, I believe in like the 18, early 1890s, some of that material started moving over to Bishop Museum. Um, and it also includes some of the oldest material from Hawaii that came from the ABCFM, the American Board of uh, Commissions for Foreign Missions, which was the Congregational Mission Church that was here in Honolulu. Um, and also across this, the kingdom. Um, and then also another royal collection, which is the collection of largely the Kalakaua family, um, which comes from the Kapi'olani Kalaniana Ole collection. And, and so it, this is a good segue too, because um, we're going to be talking about um, uh, what happens after the, the royalty, uh, what happens after the kingdom period, and how does that also influence um, Elsie Crosses a little bit? So yeah, that's oh, that's, that's Bishop Museum. Oh, yeah, 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 that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely a mouthful, um, but this at least will help situate all of the people who haven't had a chance to visit us. Um, and also give you a sense too about um, what it means to then, you know, curate kind of more textiles and and um, accessories and, and, and other material too um, within a, a museum that's so heavily strong in culture. Um, so I really want to talk today specifically about one individual, and her name is Elsie Crassus. And we're going to see more images of her work um, and a, a portrait of her um, at the very end. Um, but what I think is really fascinating about her is that she let her work speak for her. So in terms of actual images of her, there's very, very few. Um, so I've been piecing together what I can find of her work um, and, and her legacy um, for, for a case rotation um, that took place at the museum earlier this year. Um, so just for some context, we're really talking about Art Deco period here in Hawaii, specifically here in Honolulu. Um, but Elsie Crassus herself was not from Hawaii and she wasn't Hawaiian either. Um, she was born in Oklahoma received training um, on the west coast of the U.S. Um, and then eventually made her way to Honolulu um, because her husband was in the military. So she, her daughter, and her husband actually moved to Honolulu. Um, and that's when she took the first big step into actually opening her own store. Um, we have a certain area in da the downtown section of Honolulu called um, Fort Street. And this is an area that was known for its shops, um, its different retail experiences. Um, and also it was in very close proximity to kind of the business center of, of Honolulu. Um, and, and that's where she decided she wanted to open up her first um, her standalone store. And then um, she actually had her longest run, running store, though, um, in Waikiki um, on the grounds of the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, um, where she was there for, for nearly, you know, 20 years. Um, and so when we talk about even though she started in the Art Deco period, her, her career spanned much, much longer than that. Um, and, and so there are generations of, of people that remember her store um, because of just the length of time. 
Um, but here on the um, in, in the images, we have um, the street that she opened her first store on. Um, this is a 1940s photo of downtown Honolulu. Um, honestly, it looks kind of similar <laughs> to this to this day. You know, cars though, it's it's the walking street, but a lot of the buildings are actually still there, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we also have um, one of her first little ads that she was able to take out for her for her first store. Yeah, that's wonderful. That is so great. Uh, I think it's it's what what's been really fascinating though, and again, in like trying to piece together what has been able to be found is that we can never find a photo of her actual storefront in our collections, which is pretty substantial. Um, there are just not a lot of images of it that exist. So in a couple of slides from now, you'll see kind of how then we figured out how to give that sense of a storefront. Um, but everybody's probably wondering what does like what do the hats look like? Um, so. This well, yeah, is... the face hats I'm really excited about. I know, they're so cool. Um, so this is how we kind of got, got away with figuring out how do you make a, a storefront when you don't have an image of the actual storefront. So we kind of had to, to do some really creative um, drapery. <laughs> um, we looked at other references too of other hat shops. Um, and this is kind of the, the rotation that we, we got to put together um, for the museum. And we're gonna talk about all the different hats a little bit more specifically, but I wanted to give you a sense of like, what did it actually look like? Um, and and I, I will also say too, there's a challenge with this case. It's huge. It's like um, eight feet tall and, and it's standing actually on a base that's about two, two to three feet tall. So it's a huge, huge case. And so when viewers actually see this case, you're meeting at, at eye level already. And so um, we had to really play with um, um, kind of the heights in this case so that you wouldn't lose the hats, which was a challenge. But we were able to accomplish that with this really creative um, amount. So. Um, Museum people figure things out sometimes, <laughs> even with these kooky ideas. Yes, indeed. This looks great, though. I love it. I'm, I'm a great way to start it off. This is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, and so I'll show you another photo too of some of the other hats a little up, more up close. Um, but these are some of the hats that she also um, created and sold out of her store. Um, these are two hats made out of Lauhala, um, which is um, uh, the pan, um, pandanus um, tree that grows um, throughout Southeast Asia, um, even also parts of mainland China um, and in the Pacific pretty broadly. Um, and it, it's used really widely as um, a material to make mats, to make baskets, to make all types of material. And they have been be, um, used for hat making even as early as the 19th century. Um, but Elsie Crass is really kind of up the ante, I think in the early 20th century with starting to play with um, wider brims, um, more dramatic um, dimensions um, and, and playing with, with um, kind of the more modern styles that I think were, were also um, popular on the mainland of the United States. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about like how she figured all of those things out and I'll also try to make it feel very um, Hawaii specific too. Oh, I'm really excited because I'm now seeing these hats. I'm really curious. I have lots of questions about how do they, you know, how does that material respond like other millinery material like straw or things of that nature that have been used you know can, did she have to develop new kinds of sizing or new kinds of stiffening in order for that to maintain the shape things of that nature uh, yeah, tons of questions no absolutely and i think that says so much about her as a person too willing to take on that challenge of figuring things out instead of um just kind of doing the things that she was trained with, pushing herself even a little bit further. Um, and, and you're gonna see just how far she pushed herself to in relation to hats, yeah. Um, but before I, I kind of get into that too, I, I'm a historian by training. And so I wanted to make sure that um, I give you the context before the Art Deco period, because Hawaii is, is very removed from the United States at this point in history. It's also mm -hmm. not even a state, it's a territory at this point, um, a very new territory as well. Um, and so I wanted to paint a picture for, for people who aren't familiar with um, Hawaiian history about what does that actually mean in relation to um, then how Elsie Crassus responds with her hat creations? Um, so for a very brief 
brief overview of a timeline and, and gosh like as a historian i'm like gosh there's never enough for an actual and timeline but um there's some key periods here that i want to set up for you folks um 1893 was the overthrow of the hawaiian kingdom we talked about um kamehameha and we talked about kalakaua and actually it was kalakaua's younger sister Lili'u, who was the last queen of hawaii and she was um very violently deposed um, in her, of her of her um, status as a royal, um, and that happened in 1893 by a group of um, businessmen, primarily who are American and British. Um, there are also some um, local and Hawaiian um, supporters of the overthrow as well, but the main actors were largely um, uh, white uh, um, white businessmen. Um, and then that kind of ushered in this. Um, provisional government period um, called the Republic of Hawaii. Um, the Republic of Hawaii was was trying to figure things out. Um, they had their own priorities, which is how do we um, make ourselves um, be appealing enough to be considered um, for a ter as a territory of the U.S. Um, and so they really they really focused on trying to offer Hawaii um, as a, a, a territory. Um, and during this period, there was intense, intense political resistance and revolution between um, former um, kingdom citizens and this new form of government. Um, Hui Aloha Aina was um, one particularly active active group. That's um, that was very well organized across all eight Hawaiian islands, um, and and was actively protesting um, against the United States as well. And then all this to say, all of this active protesting, and then 1900 comes along, and then the Republic of Hawaii becomes the territory of Hawaii. Um, you know, I think what's really interesting and specific about this history is that people here, especially the Hawaiian community, knows this history very, very intensely, very intimately. Um, but you know, for foreigners who are visiting Hawaii for um, you know vacation or just passing through, it's not necessarily um, well known, and so. Um, I, I think it's important to also give that context to Elsie as well, because all of all of this very quick turnaround um, of political systems is what uh, actually allows Elsie to come and settle in, in Hawaii as well. Um, and so it, it, it's kind of a indigenous critique in that sense of kind of the white settle, settler colonialism that happens in the early 20th century. Um, but it's important to contextualize, I think. Thank you. Yeah. So um, there are a few couple few things that I, I do want to tie in with then what does you know uh, settler colonialism look like in the 20th century, especially is between 1900 and and the late 1920s. Um, the first big thing is that there's this huge push by the territory of Hawaii government um, to construct new roads. Um, particularly in Honolulu, um, because they want tourists to be able to drive fancy new cars to like see the sites, see the places. Um, I also should point out too that when we say that you know the provisional government was was um, largely orchestrated by American businessmen. Um, these businessmen were largely the ones that were promoting these these um, infrastructure um, rebuilds throughout Honolulu. Um, so there was definitely a lot of what we could say, probably say collusion <laughs> these days. There was a lot of beneficial benefits that you know these um, businessmen were gaining. Um, but this particular view um, in the photo on the left is from Tantlis, which overlooks Honolulu. Um, it's still like a, a site that tourists love to go and visit because it's just so breathtaking, and you get to see all of Honolulu below you. Another aspect of this um, territory government um, was making sure that people outside and especially on on the continent knew about Hawaii and that Hawaii was a new territory. And so um, that meant participating in um, expositions that were happening. So this photo on the right comes from the pa um, Panama Pacific Exposition of 1915, which was held in San Francisco. Uh, Hawaii had a huge pavilion that included daily hula shows and daily music. Um, it also included like um, a, a vendor for ukuleles that were made out of koa. Um, it also included like a whole bunch of different um, Hawaiian fish in bottles and plants and so forth. And so um, people learned about Hawaii um, at this at this event, and there were thousands of people who were visiting specifically this pavilion um, on a daily basis. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
This is another quick thing too. Then we also have steamer lines coming from the West Coast, particularly from like San Fran and LA that are, are really coming to Honolulu at, at, at high amounts. And then also too, you need to, a place for tourists to stay. So hotels are being built. Um, this was the um, Alexander Young Hotel. Um, this is a building that um, is kind of, it's not there anymore, but the 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 lot that it sits on is actually the Hawaii State Art Museum now. Um, but this was a massive hotel, and you guessed it, he was also involved in the, overthrowing the kingdom. <laughs> so it, it's all tied in. It's all tied in. But this is the this is the Hawaii that that it makes up the twentieth century. That's yeah. that's fascinating. <laughs> It's, it, it definitely, I think, like, it needs its own TV show. It needs oh, its own TV show. Absolutely. It would be far more mm -hmm. interesting than, you know, than something that's on TV right now, which I won't speak ill <laughs> of. I, I know, yeah, same sentiment. <laughs> Um, but I also want to point out that during this period of intense American colonization by businessmen and other act, um, actors as well, there were huge expressions of Hawaiian sovereignty, of resistance mm. taking place. Um, so one great example is um, a, a group called the Royal Hawaiian Band or Kobana Lahui. Um, they were um, actually government employees who were um, part of the kingdom band. Um, and when the kingdom was, got overthrown, they actually went on tour throughout the US. They went on tour, played their music. They were um, extremely popular because they were so naturally gifted in, in music. Um, they, they competed against other bands as well. So in going, going into exile, they actually increased their popularity on the continent. Um, and they actually stayed on the continent for many, many years until they decided to return home in the early 20th century. Um, and many of them actually returned to playing um, in the Royal Hawaiian Band now under the territory. Um, but what they did is they played songs of resistance in Hawaiian. And so for tourists who were visiting, you know, they're, they're like, oh, like, wow, the Hawaiian music, the Hawaiian language, it's amazing. But for, for their key audience, which were, you know, former citizens of the kingdom, they understood that music in a very different way. And so it's very subversive. It's very, um, if you know, you know, kind of thing. But I, what I think is so beautiful about that is that, that this persists to this day as well, making sure that um, our sovereignty is expressed um, through music to this day. Yeah. Okay, so this reminds me of, so I visited Hawaii, I visited Honolulu once many years ago, stunning and wonderful, and I went through the palace, and um, some wonder, there was a fabulous quilt exhibit up at the time, um, and I, I'm probably misremembering this, but when the queen was held essentially in exile in her own palace, um, I remember this story that she wasn't allowed newspapers to know what the news of the day was going on outside, but the businessmen apparently who were overthrowing her allowed hula dancers in for entertainment purposes. And if, please correct me if I'm wrong, but they essentially told her the news of the day through dance and song in exactly what you're talking about, this sort of subversive way. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, no, this story is like very, this is very important because yes, they definitely locked her up in her, her own home <laughs> as they yeah. were, as a result of a, of a counter revolution. And um, what I think is really fascinating is that they still found ways to communicate with her, you know, about the news of how people outside of, of the walls of, of her palace still supported her in big ways too. Um, so music was communication, you know, dance was communication. Um, and, and for this, this group, um, Kabana Lahui too, they were always writing home um, about where they were, who they were seeing. They were writing and publishing new music um for for people to to read and also share in the newspapers um so i think that it says so much about how um hawaiians historically have communicated and and, and to continue to do so to this day um but how that it, it wasn't necessarily um an easy way to transition into a territory period um yeah fantastic tie in leon great memory <laughs> <laughs> it was, that's a great story 
I was like, that needs to be an opera, but maybe that's not the right thing that it should be. It needs like, like I wanted her, I wanted that story to become like a Hawaiian opera, if that, uh, you know, I was oh, just yeah. like, I, because I love opera and I was like, that would be a great opera story. Yes, oh, absolutely. And Lily Wu would have probably loved that because she was such an, a fantastic musician herself. Um, another way too that expressions of sovereignty kind of shows up during the early territory period is very public forms of competition. Um, so I'm working on an exhibit right now um, for next year, and it's it's going to talk about this exact theme, expressions of sovereignty in the territory period. And what's really interesting is that um, a former prince of the kingdom, Prince Kuhio, um, he actually runs for um, the territory of Hawaii seat um, for Congress, and he wins. Um, and he he actually competed against his brother, another prince, and another Hawaiian who actually had a very popular vote at the time. And so he threw his name into that hat and, and actually won and did a lot of amazing work um, in Washington, D.C. But just as much as he was doing that type of um, kind of political advocacy, he was also competing in um, extreme sports here in Honolulu. So he actually was um, a competition um, oarsman. Um, he he actually ha uh, had commissioned the construction of the first six man racing canoe, which is actually in Bishop Museum's collections. Um, and he was actually participating in the races himself. Um, wow. So this there's this like really interesting time where, um, you know, this ocean sport becomes a sport of the political elite in Hawaii during this time period. And he sees himself in like literally seat one, like ready to go. Um, and, and so Hawaii exists in many different ways and he wasn't afraid of that competition too. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say too is that Hawaii at this time period is extremely diverse. Um, um, immigrant labor started coming into Hawaii um, in the late 1900s, um, actually through different levels of contracts um, with King Kalakaua, um, who, who was trying to make sure that um, different labor forces um, were able to, to you know, assist different types of economies here in Hawaii. Um, and so there are Chinese people who had actually come over as early as like the 1850s, Japanese people in the 1860s and 70s, um, Portuguese laborers. And so um, this type of, of um, diversity, I think, is very uncommon for parts of the United States at this time, but by the early territory period is actually the norm, um, where Hawaiians, um, as well as immigrant neighbors, are intermixing, having children, um, and so the population looks very, very different um, than the U.S. mainland. Mm -hmm. wow. So how does this tie in with Art Deco then? <laughs> Oh, um, I see. Where, I see the path you're treading. Take me there. Thank you, thank you. I was like, oh, am I reaching here? Am I reaching? But what it means is that Hawaii's form of Art Deco becomes very, very um, East-West, Asia Pacific, um, and and I think uh, the the actors in that movement had a lot, a lot of fun in terms of figuring out how do you express the culture of Hawaii. Um, through different forms of art and architecture. Um, so here on the far left is um, one of my favorite buildings that's actually still um, in existence here in Honolulu. Um, this is the Alexander and Baldwin building. Um, Alexander and Baldwin were um, former missionaries turned um, businessmen, um, and they were particularly successful in sugarcane production, which was a major uh, economic um, business here in the early territory period. Um, and, and so this building includes both Asian and Hawaiian uh kind of sent uh details so the 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 what do you call it? the roof is definitely hawaiian it's kind of like um what we call a hip roof um mm -hmm. or and, and and a lot of the other details um are actually more asian inspired and it actually has pretty fantastic mural work within it as well some mosaics oh, wow. too yeah, the building on the far right is one of my favorite um, buildings that are still is in Chinatown in downtown Honolulu. Um, this is the central fire station. Um, fantastic example of Chinese elements um, with um, uh, the need for a public work. <laughs> and so I, I haven't been able to be in this building quite yet, but um, from what I hear, it's pretty fantastic also within it, too. Um, and then also, too, there were, the Art Deco meant trying to um, figure out how do you express 
um, Hawaiian culture in a modern way. Um, so Armand Manukian was an artist that was only very briefly actually painting here in Hawaii, but his work is extremely popular to this day. Uh, we, we, this type of lobster claw um, Polynesian sail is very unique um, to Hawaii, um, but it has become kind of quintessential um, in terms of being able to kind of express the sailing culture here. Um, and, and so altogether, if you look at kind of these three, you, you get the sense of there's this tropical essence, there's also this east-west essence, but also something that's very unique to this area of the Pacific. Awesome, this is amazing. The colors in the Manukian are just beautiful and the, the slight abstraction of the figures um, is so, so beautiful. It's just really wonderful. Absolutely. I think everybody would still die to have that in their house today. <laughs> um, before we jump into Ossiecrasis, I want to also point out there, there are other artists, too, that were working at, in Hawaii around the Art Deco period. This is John Roberts. He particularly worked in ivory. Um, this is a piece that um, was actually gifted to the Bishop Museum very re recently. Um, but he was also doing what Elsie Crassus is, is going to, we're going to see, is going to do in hats. She, she's taking the elements of Hawaii seen in flowers, in lei, in pageantry, in um, other forms of um, performative culture, and, and translating that into accessories. Um, so all of these petals were hand carved and were made to be flushed with each other. Um, so it looks continuous, very much like the lei that you see on the far right. Um, and his storefront was. Um, also very close to LC Crassus. So they were they were trying to appeal to um, a higher end client, especially with the material. Um, but they were also trying to do something that local people would also recognize as being uniquely from Hawaii. Um, so there are three main things that if there's any takeaways that I would let, love for you folks to take away about Elsie Crassus. And so the first thing is that she had a thing for utilizing unique materials. Um, so this is a quote from um, a newspaper article that was published actually at the early point of her career. Um, and so she would basically go into different landscapes and try to collect things, bring it home, and then try to make a hat. Um, and so these are two examples of that. The one on the left is um, a fiber um, hat base. Um, and then glued on top of it are different elements that she actually had found on the beach. So there's coral, shells. There's even like a little cork. Um, beach plastic, which is something that we see a lot of today, but who would have ever thought to put it on a hat? Um, and what's cool about this hat too is that we think it's um, coconut fiber, which is something that would have been very readily available here. Um, but the way that she um, ha had all of the fibers um, folded, it gives it a really cool textural quality, um, which I think is like fantastic. Um, the hat on the right is also another Ooh. kind of beach inspired I, hat. Oh, go ahead, Leon. Yeah. I have a question because I'm looking at that. So, because it looks like from the picture that the the edge of the hat that they're not folded back, they're folded back. They look like they're sort of the ends of the fiber and this sort of feathery quality to it, but they're actually folded back. That's amazing. Yeah, kind of like a loop. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see that now. Wow, that's amazing. I know you can get next ideas for your next hat, <laughs> hat concept I know, it's too. Really great. And I love the shape of it. It's so good. It, it is really I, I feel like it conveys like volcanic to me. Um and and traditional Hawaiian hats don't kind of have this shape too. So she was trying to do something very uniquely different, which which I think I think catches with the audience. Um, mm -hmm. The one on the right is, is just a small little almost like beret style hat. Um, this is actually made with a fishnet with um, fiber underneath and similar to she actually went out and collected different shells and glued them on too which i think is pretty fantastic this is definitely these two hats are only we only see them once in our collection and it, these are the only examples we have um, wow. but yeah she was she was sourcing things from just about anything she could find so we're uh, so we're okay so we're all over her hats one-off creations like meaning like you they were all individuals there was no like I have you know 15 fishnet hats but they just had different shells on them so it was a 
it, it, they were all very unique creations. Yeah, we, we think that they're one-offs, basically, that each piece was considered a work of art. Um, and, and you'll see you'll see in a couple of other slides after this, too, why um, why they became one-offs, because I think she was just utilizing whatever material she had, and that's what her focus was at any given time, um, which, in terms of sustainability, um, fantastic, you know, sustainability as we mm -hmm. consider today. In terms of being able to have the time to make one unique one pieces of art, you know, that's amazing in itself. That takes some work ethic, I think. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so the second thing, too, is that she was trying to convey the traditions and um, artistic um, uh, elements that she was seeing here in Hawaii and translating that into hats. Um, so one thing that is very unique to um, traditional Hawaiian culture here, customary Hawaiian culture, is um, love of feathers. Um, Hawaiians were one of the few peoples that utilized feathers in um, large types of regalia. Um, capes, um, which which sometimes could be um, kind of fall at your mid back all the way to about your ankle. Um, it also included um, adornments called lei, which could be worn around the neck or around the head. Um, and it also we, it was used um, in, uh, in feather standards as well, which we call kahili. Um, and so all these feathers translate very. Um, they translate regalia, they translate kind of a higher echelon, um, the sense of royalty and um, regalness, which was only reserved for a certain echelon of Hawaiian society. Um, and, and those sentiments of what feathers translated even um, was something that Elsie could kind of catch on to when she even arrived in the 1920s. Um, and so she, she had liked how she was already seeing feathers being utilized and then tried to make that into a hat. Um, and so sometimes she would receive different materials from different clients of hers and ask, hey, can you figure out this and, and, and make a hat out of it? And sure enough, she was able to do it most of the time, which is <laughs> crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. I have a question about the, the birds. Do they also, um, in, in the Hawaiian uh, royal system, did they signify rank? For example, in Chinese court system and Japanese and Korean court systems, animals uh, figure in a ranking style in the in the in the traditional court systems. So, does mm -hmm. the type of bird mean have also a particular level in in that that only like this person could wear that kind of bird kind of thing? Oh yeah, I think that's a really great. Um... Uh, connection. So in, in Hawaii, there are, we are known for being one of the endemic um, bird species capitals of the world. At one point, um, a lot of those species are have now since been extinct or um, are really under threat currently. Um, but certain bird feathers uh, or feathers from a certain bird were utilized to create very specific things or to highlight the mana, the, the spiritual power, um, uh, genealog genealogical status of certain individuals um, that, that I think it was conveyed in that way. Um, so yeah. for example, there's one bird called the O'o and the O'o was found on different islands. Um, each each island basically had its own endemic O'o, which is pretty cool. Um, but from this bird, you could only take um, two um, bright yellow feathers from under the wing. So each each bird only had basically two feathers. And so that bird was caught gently, humanely, the feathers would be removed and then the bird would be let go. And so you would keep doing that to basically accumulate enough feathers to make whatever feather work you needed. So for some cases, it, we were take, talking thousands and thousands of feathers. Wow. Yeah. Wow, two feathers per bird, that's amazing. Yeah. It's crazy, yeah. And so um, even even for Elsie Crassus's hats too, though, some of the birds that she was using, you know, she wasn't using um, kind of the neck or the chest where there are a lot of feathers. Sometimes she was using just like the tip of, of a, you know, a, a peacock feather that you would have need to have collected more and more of. So I think that says something really interesting about um, how she thought about what birds um, could get utilized for a certain hat versus, you know, for another person too. Um, I think that translates really well between the connection you're making in China with historically how it went in, in Hawaii 
and then even into the 1920s, yeah. And I have a question, the two images that you have on the screen right now, the, the vibrant blue one, it looks like that hat may be covered in a net in order to keep the feathers protected. Is that is that correct? Um, but that's that's a museum conservation. Um, it was her idea. It came to oh, us really? like this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so so that's so that's actually what the hat would have when it was worn would have looked like. The feathers wouldn't have been out in the open air, shall we say? They were actually covered with the net. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think she must have had enough complaints from different clients or suggestions from clients, maybe we should say, that like, oh, it's kind of windy. I think some, some feathers would look better if it was kind of more tacked down. Um, but that all this to say, the hat on the right doesn't have that kind of mesh mm -hmm. on top of it. Um, so maybe yeah. it was just certain hats and the way that they were stitched, the feathers were stitched on to, to the base. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I would imagine there's like that nut sort of also kind of dulls the color of the feathers a little bit. I, I will say it's definitely with with that that dark, dark hue uh, of blue in, in this one, it looks more, it reads more black actually in certain lights. Um, so I think she she definitely played with that a little bit too about just the iridesc iridescence of the feathers. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. That's interesting. Thank you yeah. so much. These are amazing. Absolutely. And so the last one, too, I want to point out is, um, you know, she wasn't from Hawaii um, and she was walking into an environment that, you know, was was extremely diverse, but she she was very fascinated by the local traditions and the Hawaiian traditions of craft um, that she she actually became a supporter herself. Um, so at her two stores, um, she actually um, had um, different types of consignment um, options where where different hat makers would make hats and then they would be um, actually, you know, sold out of her shop. Um, and, and I think that's something really unique and really important is that she sought out those crafters to ask if they wanted to participate. Um, she, she had relationships with these crafters. It wasn't something she was buying in bulk. Instead, they were just like her own hats, very, very unique um, and then sold um, through, her, through her store. Um, another aspect too is that she was fascinated by the things that people would bring her that had to do with Hawaiian culture. Um, so this hat at the right is like by far my favorite. This is actually what's, a, it's called a um, popale, a popale band, or a, a feathered uh, hat band. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was it was just like kind of like how we we would have regular hat bands made out of leather or something like that. But it was basically all stitched feathers um, on a piece of felt. Um, but this client of hers actually asked if she could turn it into a hat. And so this is the, you get this cool figure eight type of um, hat accessory, if you will, um, that it, it just sits very um, at an angle on your head. Um, and this one actually had a, a piece of net mesh that was intended to kind of fall at eye level too. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, it, it's definitely conveying um, drama, <laughs> which I think is fantastic. It's um, great. It is fantastic. And this is all um, pheasant neck feathers too. Um, but the it, it matches very well with the other types of Le Bulu that we have on view here at the museum. Um, these are two examples of um, a feather lay that are on view um, in Hawaiian Hall at Bishop Museum. Um, and and you can imagine Elsie seeing these types of things when she probably came to Bishop Museum when she first arrived um, and seeing all these different patterns and these different types of approaches to using feathers um, and, and leading that to inspire her um, in her own creations too. These are amazing. These are really amazing. I think and as a museum person, like I don't I should not be saying this, but you just kind of want to run your hands over it because it just looks so like comfortable and so fluffy to touch. Yeah. Oh, they are. I mean, and you know, in my time as a costume designer, when I've actually come across a vintage hat of this name, it's like, oh, that just feels so luxurious. Super luxurious. Yeah. We should be bringing feathers back more, I think. Um, so this is one of the few portraits we have of Elsie Crassus, the, the legend behind these hats. Um, and, and again, three, three things that you should walk away with is that she um, attracted locals and tourists um, because of her, 
her distinctive style is that um, were attractive to both demographics, which I think is really unique. Um, I should also say too that how these hats came to Bishop Museum, it was a donation through her daughter. Um, her after the store closed, um, her daughter went out back to the former clients and bought back the hats and then donated uh, the collection of 40 plus hats to Bishop Museum. Um, so they stayed actually here in Hawaii and that's how, uh, how Bishop Museum was able to, um, to accession them into their collection, which I think is really cool and really unique. Um, she was a master of sourcing local materials, which I think is something that um, nowadays, especially on an island is really hard, um, but she was doing it very strongly for over 40 years. Um, and she was both inspired by and supported by uh, Hawaiian craft and makers here. Um, so I think all, all this to say, you know, we, we look at different people in the past. Um, and I think appropriation is is a real big um, hot, hot topic these days. Um, but I think what's important to notice about her is that in, in studying her, you get to get a, a clearer sense of how she did it not only by looking at the things, but who she was talking with, who were her clients, um, and how all these pieces were so unique um, that you, you get a different sense of how she worked versus I think some other people at the same time, which I think is really cool. Um, yeah, so, and yeah. also she's, she's, you know, working with the, the local craftspeople and artisans, but then making her own. So she's, mm. she's not, copying the local traditional things she's using them in a way that is new for the community there but also connecting what her heritage is in this way um, and so bringing those things together um, in, in different ways it's really amazing and and using the local resources and just being like look i found this thing on the beach let's make it into a hat is kind of incredible I think, yeah, like we talk about what sustainability is today, right? And and I think people in the past were able to figure it out in a way that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and hopefully we can try to replicate now in the present. Um, uh, so first of all, I would love to know, what is the size of the textile and costume collection at the Bishop Museum? And what other kinds of objects of dress do you have? That's a fantastic question. Um, so in terms of space, most of it is held within one room, one of our collection spaces. Um, you know, I don't think we have done a full inventory to be able to produce a number of how much material, but I can give you a sense of what's included from based oh. off of what I've seen and some of my interests. Yeah. Um, so when we talk about, um, you know, being the uh, a repository for the Hawaiian royals, we have fantastic examples of the clothes from their their actual closets. Um, so um, we have you know gowns, we have everything from we have one princess. Her name was Kaiulani. We have the clothes from when she was like a little girl all the way up into adulthood. And so she she oh. was born in the 18, 1860s, I believe, and she died in the 1890s. So we have we have quite a bit of clothing that belonged to her, like hand painted buttons. Like she was a princess, like it was clear, you know. Um, we also have fantastic jewelry collections from the Hawaiian Royals as well. Um, they had really good taste. Um, uh, things that they actually purchased when they visited Europe on different trips, um, and also things that they actually were able to somehow get from Paris and, and England, et cetera. Um, we also have a pretty substantial collection of um, what we call the Hawaii Immigrant Collection. So they mm -hmm. are um, materials that were collected from different uh, immigrant communities to Hawaii during that sugar plantation period largely. Um, mm -hmm. And, and the, the clothes and materials that they actually um, had brought back with them from their homelands, the clothes that they made for themselves here. Um, mm -hmm. One fantastic example of this is, um, this is maybe a little bit more textile-y, but, um, they one 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 auntie she had made all of these individual quilts for her family using um rice bags um mm -hmm. and sugar bags that she had and and so she made them for different sizes of beds and so those were actually donated by the family as well so um i hope that answers your question it's quite extensive 
Oh, that's we need fantastic. a whole building. <laughs> we don't need a brand new textile building. <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Okay, so there's some things in the chat that I'll read off and, and we'll get to. Um, so Margaret says, thank you for keeping the hats themselves at eye level, exclamation point. Um, Marion Ann says, we have a few feathered hats with netting on them from the 1950s at the Museum of Texas Tech. Um, uh, I don't know who they were made by offhand, but I've been wondering about the netting also. So thank you for that. That's great. And then another, uh, Margaret says, when my mother made a fe pheasant feather hat in the 1960s, she covered it with netting. Her color choice for the netting made the netting almost invisible and had no muting effect on the pheasant feathers. Um, Marcy says, when I was in Honolulu a while ago, I went to the Bishop Museum and was surprised and fascinated by the dog teeth necklaces. Mm. Do you know if these, are, if these are in other museums or are they just special to Hawaii? So dog teeth and porpoise teeth um, were used throughout the Pacific in different types of adornments. Um, particularly here in Hawaii, they were used um, as necklaces worn around the neck, mm. um, but also adornments worn on the wrist and ankles. Um, and sometimes um, even like a, a calf wrap almost. Um, and they were utilized by people who were dancers, people who were, uh, you know, performers. Um, we have a particularly fantastic example of, you know, these types of dog teeth implements um, or adornments. Um, but I have seen them at other museums, particularly in Europe, um, different examples of dog teeth. But yeah, it takes a lot of dog teeth to make one adornment, <laughs> especially because you need to drill each hole in each tooth. It, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this was before people had television. Yeah. And really good eyesight? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Little tiny drills. <laughs> oh, pardon me. Um, Tori says, uh, as traditional Hawaiian featherwork is associated with royal and religious regalia, was there any public response to exhibiting non-royal featherwork? Really good question. The answer is yes, I would say. You know, I think there's been... Um, so in Hawaiian Hall, um, where our, our that rotation took place, um, is has a really uh, strict narrative, if you will. So the first floor talks about um, how the, um, the first gods came to Hawaii um, and established themselves here in these islands. Um, the second the second uh, floor talks about the crafts that came from the lands, everything from weaving to fishing to um, kapa making or bark cloth making, all of the different types of unique mm. um, cultural practices that make makes Hawaii unique. Then the third, third floor talks about um, the Hawaiian royals um, and, and largely the 19th century um, of the kingdom period. And so this rotation definitely was a little different than I think what most visitors usually expect out of um, different types of rotations we do at Bishop Museum. Um, but that being said, I was really fortunate to be able to kind of push it a little bit, push the envelope a little bit, um, because I think what's really important is understanding how in the 20th century, um, a lot of these things did persist, but maybe just in a little different ways, um, maybe with different, um, you know, support from other people, different collaborations. Um, and, and I think this is important too, because here at the museum, we have such extensive, extensive collections that we, we are trying to kind of move away from this idea that we are purely 19th century kingdom Hawaii. Um, what are we after the territory? What are we in different um, decades and so forth? And so, um, you know, overall the response is really cool because I've been able to give the presentations like this and actually dig into who Elsie Crassus is. Um, but from, I think, yeah, exactly, uh, Hawaiian royal featherwork element, it's very different from the featherwork that usually is, is on display um, in, in that gallery. Um, but altogether, people weren't too upset. So we can, we can try to continue to introduce 20th century ideas in connection to the richness of Hawaiian culture. So thanks, Tori, for the question. Awesome, great. Um, a couple more. Um, have you done any consultation work for Jason Momoa's television production of Chief of War? Ah, Jason did come to um, Bishop Museum a number of times. 
Um, and I know that he worked with quite a number of practitioners as well, who oftentimes we actually have worked with as well. So we haven't necessarily had direct relationship with um, Jason's um, team in relation to Chief of War, but um, he has he has been a friend of our department. He actually did come and see our Featherwork collection too. So I'm just as excited as you guys are to, to see it um, on TV. Um, another question, we have time for a couple more. Um, uh, this is also from Marcy. I also saw fantastic long feather capes at the Bishop. How do you preserve them? Fantastic question. Um, it is very difficult. It is very difficult. You know, feathers, I, I mean, we didn't even get to talk about this, but feathers as a material, super sensitive to light and fading, um, very, um, prone to collecting dust, um, very um, delicious to all these types of bugs um, that we all definitely have here in Hawaii. Every bug will eat it if they had a chance. Um, <laughs> and also humidity too, you know, we, we deal with humidity in a very intense way here in Hawaii because it um, during the summer it's like really hot, um, even up until like the high 90s, even, um, you know, low hundreds for in, at, on a really rough day. Um, and so those things, you know, feathers take the beating. Um, so the answer that we have is as best as we can, climate control, humidity control. Um, but the key for us is um, making sure that they are not in, exposed to UV for long periods of time. Um, so that means making sure that they are in um, darkness um, until they're either going to be put on display or they're being visited by different people. Um, and so we really try our best I don't think that in a in a perfect world we could have featherworks every everywhere on our display, um, but we always have to make the hard decision sometimes to make sure that these things can rest so that they can be enjoyed by future generations. Um, you know, they've lasted hundreds of years up to this point, which is nothing short of a miracle and speaks to the caretaking of our predecessors. But how do we make sure that we're we're doing that for for future too? Yep. Thank you. Um, and a couple last things off topic, but relevant to the speaker. Can you point to some Kappa Tapa resources to learn more about its deep and ancient history in Hawaii and in the Pacific? Great question. Um, I would say that there are some fantastic publications that recently came out on um, bark loss from the Pacific. Um, there are also a number of different practitioners um, here in Hawaii that have become full-time practitioners in Hawaiian bark loss. Um, the, one of them is Delaney Tanahi. She works out of Makaha and she actually does a lot of classes. So I'd really recommend researching her because she, she does a lot of outreach. Um, another one is actually in our department. Her name is Kamala Dupriz. Um, and she um, actually learned from one of um, members of a group that actually revitalized the craft in the 70s um, and her name was Moana Isley um, and so I would say reaching like doing some secondary research on on who has who's doing bark cloth now um, because a lot of those people are actually um, publishing very actively about um, the revitalization taking place right now. In terms of big offerings and what we're, we're really looking for for 2024, um, you know, researchers that are interested in visiting the collections here at Bishop Museum can um, email us at ethnology at bishopmuseum.org. Um, we check that email very regularly. So if there's a, a, a time that you are already going to be um, visiting Kauai, please let us know and we'll try our best to accommodate you. Um, but we're really gearing up for FestPAC in 2024. Um, FestPAC is the Festival of Pacific Arts, which is basically the Olympics of Pacific culture. It happens once every four years and Hawaii was set to host it eight years ago um, but due to COVID we weren't able to um, kind of accommodate that. So now it, we're next year is our redemption year which is really really exciting um, and so Bishop Museum is going to be the host for a lot of cool activities. So some of the feather work that we were talking about, the, the fantastic cloaks and capes etc, some of that will be on view so please come and check us out. Oh fantastic, how long is Best Pack going? is only 10 days in the month of June, so the middle oh, month, huh. middle weeks of June. Um, but the exhibit that we're actually mounting here at Bishop Museum called Kaula Vena, which is going to look at red uh, as a color throughout the Pacific and its symbolism, is going to um, run from, I think, about May until the end of 2024. Okay, so can I crash on your sofa if I come for those 10 days? Absolutely, you can come on it. You can see the hats in person. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Excellent. Sarah, thank you so much. This is, we've just gone over time. This has been so wonderful. It is a pleasure to, to see you and to work with you. Um, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, I would, again, great thanks to Sarah for her time and the effort of this. Um, please follow the Costume Society of America on Facebook and Instagram to make sure you hear about all of our upcoming episodes of Conversations on Dress. Lastly, if you enjoyed tonight's content, I implore you to make a small or large donation to CSA to help keep this content free for all. Um, thank you all. Thank you again, Sarah. Lovely to see you. Have a good night, everyone.